Hello, folks, and welcome to another episode of Hangouts and Headlines, April 18th, 2024. I'm very happy to be here with you all, and thank you so much for coming. Even though it's been more than a month since our last Hangouts and Headlines episode, I am sorry about that, folks. I didn't realize it was that long when I was doing virtual legality episodes in between these two Hangouts and Headlines episodes, so my sincere apologies for the long break there, but I'm very glad that so many of you have popped back in. Uh, on this fairly random Thursday in April, but I think it's a good conversation to have about the state of media, in particular, the state of national public radio, which is a media outlet here in the United States, for those that don't know in the chat, that is funded at least a little bit by public funds and is designed to be a kind of for the entire populace, regardless of politics, outlet. So this is a very interesting conversation around media. And as we do here in Hangouts and Headlines, we like to read the articles that are before us critically, but I'm also just very interested in how the media operates, exactly what it is that they report on, what they don't, how they report on that. And so stories like what we're going to talk about today is of supreme interest to me as both a lawyer and as a citizen of the United States. So I'm very glad to see you all here, and I am thankful for your presence. So as we do in Hangouts and Headlines, we're going to hang out first for a little while before we get into the headlines. If you are watching this after the fact, you can check out the timestamps in the description of this video and jump ahead to the headlines if that's what you want to do. But part of this show is connecting with the community here at Hoag Law and having good conversations about whatever anybody's interested in. So if you've got questions or you want to talk to me, let me know and we can chat about it whenever you like. As Against the Tide, one of my moderators here says, don't forget... Reasonable minds can differ. And honestly, I think if everybody in this story that we're going to talk about today were wearing Reasonable Minds Can Differ shirts or had Reasonable Minds Can Differ stickers on their laptops, this might have gone a little bit better. I don't know. They're not magical, but they can communicate things of import. And I, it's very fun for me to go to my clinics that help my recovery or the hospital and see some of those messages around because I do think it's a very important philosophy and ethos, especially for journalists and people that are ostensibly reporting on the truth. But for anyone, it's just important to understand that the other side of a given issue is not subhuman, right? It doesn't make them somehow evil or the orcs from Mordor or whatever, and that it's better off if we can all have conversations about all of these topics. So thank you for reminding us of that against the tide. I really appreciate it. Hyacinth says the only regular radio station I listen to is NPR, which is fair. Hey, I have said here in this space that I follow Vox and Fox, meaning that I try to triangulate from a bunch of different reporting because I can recognize that there are a bunch of different ways of looking at different issues, which doesn't change the underlying reality of the fact, and we'll get into that a little bit later in this video, but does understand that different people can have different ways of reporting on the same thing. So if you'd like NPR and the way they report on things, great. I'm glad that you found it, Hyacinth. Uh, and I will continue to advocate for at least getting a couple of different perspectives on these things. But NPR is a very good source of information, certainly. Ms. Opinionated says National Public Radio is an American nonprofit media organization headquartered in Washington, D.C. Someone asked what NPR was, Shireen, apparently. So, yes, they are. And, and part of the arguments that you have about this is that they are at least a little bit publicly funded. Um, and... Different people will say that they are either a lot publicly funded or a little publicly funded, but they do receive certain amounts of money publicly, which is how these politics issues get a little bit more heightened than they would if we were talking about the politics of Vox or Fox or the New York Times or anywhere else. All right. <laughs> See what else comments we have here. If you want to get my attention, just at Hoglawmy or otherwise put a queue up or or let me know. I will try to have a little bit of hangout time. Let me know where you're chatting in from if you are interested in doing so. Otherwise, don't dox yourself, folks. I'm not trying to hunt you down or anything, but I do appreciate it. And it is fun, a fun part of the uh, the episode. And thank you so much already for Half-Blood Hella becoming a new member of the channel. Thank you so much for being members. Memberships really do help support all of the things we do here. And then gifting five Hoglaw memberships. Thank you for that, Half-Blood Hella. And Midnight Dreary, always showing up with their wonderful cat avatar and gifting a Hogla membership from time to time. Thank you so much, Midnight Dreary. I really appreciate all of that. So with that said, thank you for all of that. And we will try to make sure that we stay on pace and follow the chat and do the live stream things that we should be more accustomed to doing, honestly, frankly, here at this stage in the channel's life. But 
We'll we'll work on it together. We'll get through it. Okay. Wheezy, question, when do we find out the Stroke Awards winner? So if the, if you weren't following the channel a couple of weeks ago, the American Stroke Association, which is a division of the American Heart Association, uh, nominated me for a Voter's Choice Stroke Hero Award, which still feels weird to say for me. Uh, but all the voting was conducted in that couple of week period, and then they will be announcing the winner on May 1st. So if we won, we might have a celebratory stream there. Uh, with some of my friends, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that we won and I'm hopeful that I can put that together. Uh, but it will be at the top of May, uh, when we find out for sure. Good morning, Becca N from Seattle. It is very early morning in Seattle. So thank you for popping in so early. Watching from Norfolk, England. I think I pronounced that right. I never understand how to pronounce Norfolk or Norfolk. Uh, so hopefully I pronounced it somewhat close, Caden Banford. Thank you so much. And it's a little bit later in England, of course, but I'm very appreciative of you jumping in and just ignore me saying good morning to you from time to time. <laughs> Hi from Northern Ontario. That's much closer to home than England, at least. Uh, so welcome Canadians, uh, to the chat. Always happy to see you. I know, uh, my favorite Canadian, Ian Runkle, has been very busy having videos from time to time and talking about all sorts of law things. There's a lot of people in my neck of the woods doing law things this week. I know that a number of my law tube friends are covering the Karen Reed trial. I think it's Karen, which I don't know so well. So don't ask me questions about the specifics there. But I know that they're talking about that because I see it in the background. So please do remember to check out those folks on YouTube, if you're interested in that case or other cases, because Emily D. Baker and Legal Bites and Ian Runkle and Law and & Lumber and all sorts of other folks are talking about all sorts of interesting legal things happening in the world virtually every day. It seems like every second I see them announcing some kind of uh, show or update. So if you're interested in those things, we've got you covered. June B., also with the weather update, says it's a rainy morning in Colorado. I I don't know whether to apologize for that or not. Maybe you like the rain. I like spring rain, certainly. That's one of my favorite kind of sounds and smells and feelings is a spring rain. So maybe you love it. So thank you for letting me know, June B. And I hope you're having a wonderful morning. Before the grave says Karen Reed's courthouse is only 10 minutes from me. Uh, fair enough. So yeah, I think that it's a big deal, as far as I understand, since all my friends are talking about it, but I don't know the first thing about it. So apologies there. Matthew says there was the rust sentencing as well, I think. Uh, yes, there was a rust sentencing. I believe Hannah got 18 months uh, for her penalty in the rust killing, rust killing. So I, I know a lot of my friends have talked about the fact that the Alec Baldwin side of things will be happening this summer and might even be worse than uh, Hannah's case there. So that'll be something interesting to watch as well. <laughs> Joe says, woo, hype man, hoag. You know, they're doing fantastic work. And I often look at what my I'm doing on my channel and feel like I wish I could do it as often as they are. I'm still working on my energy levels and figuring out how this channel should operate in the new world order. But... I just want to say that they're fantastic and people should check out everything that they do because I find it to be very informative basically all the time. Shireen says, this is a great break from LawTube and Core TV. Thanks, Ho. Love h, h Yeah, we got some fun media stuff to talk about today uh, and it will be lightly political. So as always, reasonable minds can differ. Uh, but I think it's a very interesting story and I'm always fascinated by media stories like the one we're going to talk about today. I'm the kind of guy that was reading ombudsman reports on media for newspapers and outlets that I wasn't even reading because I find the policing of ethics internally and internal structures of institutions like journalism to be endlessly fascinating. So hopefully you find it as interesting as I do because we're going to get into it pretty deep today. So thank you so much, Shireen, and thank you for being a member for all those long months. I really appreciate it. The Sharpie says 18 months was the maximum and she was given violent offender status and this and thus won't be eligible for parole until at least 85 percent is served. That's remarkable, honestly, for that chain of events. I wasn't even sure she was going to get convicted, honestly, as to what was presented in court. So it is at least clear from that to me that that particular jurisdiction is very 
concerned slash upset about the state of affairs and is looking to punish the folks involved in the, the shooting. So if I'm Alec Baldwin, I'm a little bit concerned about that particular uh, conviction uh, and and the way it went. But we'll see how that goes, certainly over the summer in the long term. Charlie, did I miss the NPR story? No, Charlie, we always start hangouts and headlines with the hangouts. Uh, and then we're going to get into the headlines probably in a couple of minutes, maybe 10, 15, uh, and then go through the headlines and then have a hangouts portion afterwards so that we can talk about what we just discussed. Uh, so you haven't missed the headline yet. And if you want to come back after we are done with the show, there will be a timestamp, hopefully, if I do things right, that will lead directly to the headline portion of our discussion. So that is how these shows work. And I know I switch between virtual legality and hangouts and headlines. So I do like to remind people of that even if uh, they've been here a long time. So thank you for asking, Charlie. I don't, I do want to make clear you haven't missed anything. Erin says she didn't apologize or seem remorseful for the loss of life. That life that will make a judge upset, certainly only for her own circumstances. So yeah, I, I think that can get you in trouble when you're looking at a sentencing hearing or anything like it. So I, I totally understand if that's what happened. Against the tide says Hannah's word in the police interview got her the jury verdict. Her words in the phone calls got her the sentencing. W.D. Prescott says Hannah also basically got up and said, I'm sorry this happened to me. And then her jailhouse calls were damning, uh, which is similar to what Against the Tide just said. So that that's understandable how that could happen. But it is certainly something I'd be worried about if I were another potential defendant in this state of affairs. The angry Latina lawyer says, just finished reading The Expanse. I love the TV show. Might watch the show next to evaluate differences. My wife has read both the books and watched the TV show. Uh, I think she... She thinks the show is very, very faithful to the books up through when the show ends, which is essentially at the end of book six, I think. Uh, so I'll be interested in hearing what you think, The Angry Latina Lawyer, uh, because it's one of my favorite TV shows of all time, certainly. Okay. Kelly C. Hogue, thoughts on the Michigan football burger outcome? Smiling, laughing emoji. Uh, yes. So if that doesn't make any sense to you, I don't blame you. Michigan football had a series of potential NCAA violations this past year, one of which the Michigan fan base tends to call the cheeseburger issue or cheeseburger gate. Uh, and Michigan recently got a three year set of probation and a couple of what they call show cause orders, preventing a number of coaches from taking a job in an NCAA affiliated institution for a year. Uh, related to something to do with buying cheeseburgers for recruits. But we don't actually have the full report yet. So all I would say is after after reading the penalty statement that the NCAA news outlet put out, Kelly C., I did think that it's notable that that's only cheeseburger gate. It's not anything with sign stealing or anything else. And I do think that you still have to watch for what the NCAA might do with the sign stuff, especially because putting Michigan on probation for that technically would seem to have them on probation during the sign stealing stuff, even though that sounds like it's a little bit ex post facto, right? Because they wouldn't have known they were on probation at the time. It's still a potential problem for them. So I don't think that means that sign stealing is going to get crazy or anything from the NCAA. And the NCAA is kind of flailing about with what powers and rights they have in any event at this point in 2024. But Michigan, I don't think is out of the woods yet. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what, if anything, the NCAA NCAA decides to do with the sign stealing stuff. HP, thank you for the super chat. I really appreciate the support of the channel. Have you watched the Fallout show yet? I have watched the Fallout yet show yet uh, in its complete completeness, actually, which is rare for me. Um, but if you watch the Bitcast on Sundays, you'll know that I talked about Fallout a little bit. I was about halfway through on the last episode, uh, and I quite enjoy it. I am not the biggest fan of the Bethesda Fallout games. Bethesda bought the Fallout franchise after the first two games were made, and those were ones that I was more familiar with. They came out when I was uh, in high school or at the end of high school and I had more time to play PC games like Fallout. Uh, the Bethesda games are big and expansive, but they aren't as focused on storytelling as those older games were. Uh, but I do think that the show captured what it feels like to play Fallout in a way that was unexpected. That's a hard thing to do for a television show. Uh, and while I think it gets a little bit silly at the end, I, I think it gets a lot silly at the end. You'll probably hear me talk about that on the BitCast this coming Sunday. 
uh, I think it's well worth people's time. So if you're interested at all in it, check it out, 100%. And Joe Beer, thank you for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Will you be joining Alita during the read trial? I wasn't planning on it. I actually didn't know whether she'd be doing day-to-day -day coverage of that trial or not. Uh, but I'll probably circle back with my friends after this episode later on in the day and see what everybody's doing if they want me, right? I don't want to impose myself on other folks that have plans to do things on their own channels. So we'll see. But no, no current plans to join Alita during the read trial. Thank you, Joe. And JJ with a dog. Good morning from Utah. I worked as a journalist in a former life, still freelance now. I'm very curious about this. Yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting things happening here and a lot of things that we can dive into when we go through these various articles. So I'm glad you're curious about this. I am also curious about how this is being handled at NPR and other institutions. And I think it's very interesting to see, as we will see here, a media entity like NPR reporting on itself. That's always a wild state of affairs. And I think it's interesting the way they've done it to here. So hang on, we'll be getting to that in just a couple minutes. Ray XYZ says it's great as an adaptation and in its own merits. I got to believe that's talking about The Expanse. I was completely surprised at how good it is. I love The Expanse TV show. So please do check it out uh, if you're interested in hard science fiction, essentially. Uh, realistic science fiction that can at least, you can see how this could happen sometime in the future. It doesn't have warp travel. It doesn't have things that are fantasy-like, like a Star Wars, uh, although it does have not supernatural elements, but things that are outside our understanding of science. So take that with a grain of salt as you will, but I love the expanse. Against the Tide, BitCast is awesome and watching. You laugh a lot. You don't have to play games to enjoy watching it. We do goof on each other a lot, certainly. Um, so if you watched Lawyers and Dragons and you saw Ty Guy Travis come in and you liked his appearance, he's one of the hosts at BitCast. Uh, and he is a snarky fellow. And we like to uh, snipe at each other a little bit on various things that we disagree on, even though we still, at the end of the day, are friends and reasonable minds can differ on those things. But I think it's a great show. Please do check it out uh, because it, you don't need to like games, as Against the Tide says here, to have a fun, good conversation with smart people that are trying their best to be open to othering, other perspectives, even when it's sometimes difficult for folks like Travis. Travis taking strays. Cookie Monster, thank you for being a member for so long. I miss the old cadence, but really enjoy these when we get them. Looking forward to this review. Honestly, to some extent, I miss the old cadence too, Cookie Mon Steve. I am working through trying to figure out exactly how much of this I can do. And it takes a certain level of news item for me to want to get all the stuff together and put out a show like this one. So I think that's good in terms of the quality and the level of stuff that we're talking about here. But obviously, it's bad for Cadence and for folks that just like to have this space to, to converse in and to, to watch these kinds of things every morning. So I understand the difference, uh, but I am doing my best to make sure I'm here as often as I possibly can be while still keeping everything else working as it should. Matthew, thank you so much for being a member for so long. Need to catch up on the BitCast as well. Curious about your opinion on the Star Wars Outlaws situation, Hogue. I don't know what the quote unquote situation is with respect to Star Wars Outlaws. We do talk about it this last week. So you can look at what we talked about with respect to Outlaws. But in terms of pricing, Ubisoft has essentially the same pricing as it always does on its game. So that doesn't bother me. Everything else related to Outlaws, kind of the character design and things like that also doesn't bother me. I didn't love the vibe of the Outlaws trailer. It was a little bit young adult, a little bit not what I was looking for from a outlaws or scoundrels approach to the star wars universe but i like ubisoft i like star wars i will undoubtedly be getting that game and i hope it's fantastic because I, I like to like things you know good things are good i know that's the deep insights that you come to this channel for so good things are good that sounds like a t-shirt on its own midnight jerry says are you okay with the day one dlc with outlaws i am ubisoft has generally taken a small mission that is, honestly, if we're, if we're being completely frank, pretty junk, like very small mission, and put it as part of the DLC package, like with Assassin's Creed. I'm used to that. It's never really moved the needle for me one way or the other. I suspect that's exactly what they're doing with Outlaws. You don't have to love it. I don't love it as a practice, but it doesn't bother me. So am I okay with it? The answer to that is yes. And Katie says, Ubisoft equals wait five minutes and the price will go down. And I did say that on BitCast as well which is to say Ubisoft has this kind of analytics mode of selling its video games 
that takes the price and puts it at what it thinks it can maximally get from the audience that cares about it the most on day one and then reduces it massively within a month. So if you want that game and you don't like the pricing, Katie Cotton is right. Wait a little bit and Ubisoft games are made available to you at a significant discount very early on. All right. So I think that's about it for topics. We talked a little bit about Star Wars without getting into a fight because Travis isn't here. We talked a little bit about weather uh, and uh, other court cases going on. So I'm very happy to see all of you. And I really am very excited to have so many of you here, even when I only announce an episode a day in advance and you don't really know when you're going to see me again in the Hangouts and Headlines space. So I do apologize for that, but I'm so happy to have you here. All right. So with that said, let's talk about NPR. So this is a substack called the Free Press, and we don't usually report on or talk about substacks here. And that might be something that we change as we go forward in Hangouts and Headlines, because honestly, the substacks that I have seen are some of the best reporting the most detailed reporting that I have read out of all the things that I've looked at over the past, let's call it six months or so. And so I think Substacks are probably a version of the future of reporting. Uh, and if you're interested in getting specific reporting from somebody, I do recommend checking out the various Substacks that you can see. I, I follow a couple in the video game space and the tech space and the legal space. Uh, and I think that they're all very good. You get updates in your inbox when they put up a new article and it's, it's a good process, but I'm not getting paid by Substack to promote their services here. So we'll just press on with what we've got in front of us. This is from the senior, a senior business editor at National Public Radio NPR named, uh, I think it's Yuri Berliner. It could be Uri. Uh, so I apologize if I'm getting your name wrong, Mr. Berliner. I, I suspect you're definitely watching this episode of Hangouts and Headlines. Uh, I kid sarcastically. Uh, it says here under the caption for his photo that he's he started sounding the alarm internally when he noticed a bias creep into the network's coverage. And the name of his article is, I've been at NPR for 25 years. Here's how we lost America's trust. Yuri Berliner, a veteran at the public radio st institution, says the network lost its way when it started telling listeners how to think. And this was an article on April 9th, 2024, so a, a little bit more than a week ago. And he starts off by saying, you know the stereotype of the NPR listener, an EV driving, electric vehicle driving, wordle playing, tote bag carrying coastal elite. It doesn't precisely describe me, but it's not far off. I'm Sarah Lawrence educated, was raised by a lesbian peace activist mother. I drive a Subaru and Spotify says my listening habits are most similar to people in Berkeley. I fit the NPR mold. I'll cop to that. And one thing I wanted to note at the top of this article, right? So we know that it's called Here's How We Lost America's Trust. We know that this is going to be an article that is at least a little bit confrontational and critical of NPR, the company at which he works. But the first thing that he feels the need to do, and I don't necessarily blame him for this, is to essentially state his bona fides, right? To say, here is my identity. Here's why you shouldn't just dismiss this criticism out of hat. And so he says, look, uh, I know that you think of NPR listeners as electric vehicle driving, wordle playing, tote bag carrying coastal elites. And here's the reasons why you should still trust me because I'm in that group too, right? So you already have this conversation point, which is actually going to be pretty critical to what he complains about with respect to NPR itself. And he starts off his argument, if you will, by saying, don't put me in this other group. Don't underestimate what I'm saying because I'm in your in group. And that's part of the problem that he's going to identify at NPR. It's true NPR has always had a liberal bent, but during most of my tenure here, an open-minded, curious culture prevailed. We were nerdy, but not knee-jerk activist or scolding. And I think liberal is an interesting word here. It's certainly one that we talk about in politics a lot, the United States. Liberal has as its base root, the kind of concept of freedom, right? It means free. You, you hear this described more often now as a kind of classical liberal notion, uh, but liberality in and of itself is not something that is anathema to conservative, even though we use conservative and liberal to mean the opposite sides of the political coin in the United States. So when he says we had a liberal bent, he means towards democratic principles, but he doesn't mean like left wing as we would assume it today as we were nerdy, but not knee-jerk activist or scolding. 
In recent years, however, that has changed. Today, those who listen to NPR or read its coverage online find something different. The distilled worldview of a very small segment of the U.S. population. If you are a conservative, you will read this and say, duh, it's always been this way. But it hasn't. For decades since its founding in 1970, a wide swath of America tuned to NPR for reliable journalism. Sure, okay. And what? Gorgeous audio pieces with birds singing in the Amazon. Yes, NPR's always been a kind of wild duck. Millions came to us for conversations that exposed us to voices around the country and the world radically different from our own, engaging precisely because they were unguarded and unpredictable. No image generated more pride within NPR than the farmer listening to Morning Edition from his or her tractor at sunrise. Back in 2011, although NPR's audience tilted a bit to the left, it still bore a resemblance to America at large. And pay attention to these paragraphs because this is one of the areas where he's going to get into trouble. 26% of listeners describe themselves as conservative, 23% as middle of the road, and 37% as liberal back in 2011. But by 2023, the picture was completely different. Only 11% describe themselves as very or somewhat conservative, 21% as middle of the road, and 67% of listeners said that they were very or somewhat liberal. We weren't just losing conservatives, we were also losing moderates and, I highlighted it here, traditional liberals. Again, he's using the term liberal a little bit differently than even the polls that he's quoting here. He's trying to separate liberal, I think, from progressive or left wing. Uh, so he's saying we're losing traditional liberals. His stats don't actually say that. And I, I point that out just because that jumped out at me while I read it. Uh, but he's... Uh, opining as to the fact that they're losing this kind of more free-seeking, truth-seeking, liberal ideal in exchange for what? We can assume it's left-wing progressivism, but he doesn't say that specifically. An open-minded spirit no longer exists within NPR, and now, predictably, we don't have an audience that reflects America. That wouldn't be a problem for an openly polemical news outlet serving a niche audience, the Voxes and the Foxes, if you will. But for NPR, which purports to consider all things, they have a show called All Things Considered, it's devastating both for its journalism and its business model. So that's his premise, right? We don't reflect American society anymore, and that's a problem for us. Like many unfortunate things, the rise of advocacy took off with Donald Trump. As in many newsrooms, his election in 2016 was greeted at NPR with a mixture of disbelief, anger, and despair. And then here he has a parenthetical where he once again says, but don't just dismiss me as a Trump supporter. Just to note, I eagerly voted against Trump twice, but first, but felt we were obliged to cover him fairly. But what began as tough, straightforward coverage of a belligerent truth-impaired president veered towards efforts to damage or topple Trump's presidency. So he says, okay, so we can be against Trump, but at some point we went into advocacy, which is a problem for journalists everywhere. We've talked about that in this space in Hangouts and Headlines before. And that's what he's identifying here is that NPR, in his words, in his view, became something that was an advocate instead of a reporter. Persistent rumors that the Trump campaign colluded with Russia over the election became the catnip that drove reporting. At NPR, we hitched our wagon to Trump's most visible antagonist, Representative Adam Schiff. Schiff, who was the top Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, became NPR's guiding hand, its ever-present muse. By my count, NPR hosts interviewed Schiff 25 times about Trump and Russia. During many of those conversations, Schiff alluded to purported evidence of collusion. The Schiff talking points became the drumbeat of NPR news reports, and in fact, many reports. But when the Mueller report found no credible evidence of collusion, NPR's coverage was notably sparse. And the, and the Mueller report is a, a big report. It's a, a strange beast. It's one that I have talked about on Twitter when it came out. I didn't run this show or any show. I didn't have a channel at the time, uh, but I went through it and looked at the various ways that it was analyzed. Uh, and so you might have seen my summary of the report online from time to time because there's a page out there with my name on it. Uh, but it is a, a weird thing. It didn't reach any uh, any evidence of Russian collusion, and a lot of folks didn't report on it. It is one thing to swing and miss on a major story. Unfortunately, it happens. You follow the wrong leads. You get misled by sources you trusted. You, you're emotionally invested in a narrative, and bits of circumstantial evidence never add up. And I maybe should have highlighted this part in a different color. Part of this article from Mr. Berliner seems to suggest that emotionally invested in a narrative is one of the things he is seeing at NPR. It's bad to blow a big story. But what's worse is to pretend it never happened, to move on with no mea culpas, no self-reflection. 
especially when you expect high standards of transparency from public figures and institutions, but don't practice those standards yourself. That's what shatters trust and engenders cynicism about the media, about any institution. He's right there, right? Especially if in your, when you're in the media, your job is to look at these institutions and evaluate their transparency and the, and the steps and actions that they are taking. So certainly journalists have a high standard. It's one of the reasons they have ethical standards. It's one of the reasons we have a show here that talks about them so often is that because no person on earth can know all the things that happen in the world, we have to have a certain level of trust in the people that are reporting the truth of what's happening out there. And if we don't have that trust, we lose kind of the entire foundational principles that we have as to what is even happening in the world. So as a criticism, this might not seem fair to any given institution, but I think it's very fair for a media institution, especially one that is publicly funded and puts itself out there as being a reporter of truth that is for every American. But Russiagate was not NPR's only miscue. In October 2020, the New York Post published the explosive report about the laptop Hunter Biden abandoned at a Delaware computer shop containing emails about his sordid business dealings. Now, that's an editorial line, right? Sorted. With the election only weeks away, NPR turned a blind eye. Here's how NPR's managing editor for news at the time explained the thinking. We don't want to waste our time on stories that are not really stories. And we don't want to waste the listeners' and readers' time on stories that are just pure distractions. But it wasn't a pure distraction, says Mr. Berliner, or a product of Russian disinformation, as dozens of former and current intelligence officers suggested. The laptop did belong to Hunter Biden. Its contents revealed his connection to the corrupt world of multi-million dollar influence peddling and its possible implications for his father. The laptop was newsworthy. And in fact, I did a video on this channel about Twitter blocking the, the links to the New York Post article about the laptop and how that was a potential problem for a who watches the watchers scenario where we should be able to evaluate newsworthiness and truthfulness of what's being reported as readers. And to be blocked from that is a major problem for our critical understanding of the world because we shouldn't be uh, beholden to the gatekeepers on the tech basis for what it is that we're allowed to know. Uh, here, uh, Mr. Berliner is saying NPR didn't even want to talk about it. During a meeting with colleagues, I listened as one of NPR's best and most fair-minded journalists said it was good we weren't following the laptop story because it could help Trump. And Mr. Berliner here, obviously, at the top of his discussion talks about Trump being a major turning point. I think we've seen that in a lot of institutions. It is certainly okay for folks to dislike Trump or to like him, as a matter of fact. But when you are a reported outlet that is supposed to be telling you what's happening and what's going on in the world, saying, I don't want to report on this thing because it could help my political opponent is a problem. I think that is a, a perfectly fine justification for an article like this one. When the essential facts of the post reporting were confirmed and the emails verified independently about a year and a half later, we could have fessed up to our misjudgment. But like Russian collusion, we didn't make the hard choice of transparency. And here, this is the second kind of prong of Mr. Berliner's attack on NPR. Uh, he is suggesting that not only do we make the mistakes in the first instance, but we don't have those mea culpas he talked about, right? We don't have the transparency. We don't look as to why we got this wrong. And while I think some of this comes across a little bit like we didn't report it the way I would have liked to have reported it, and that can always be an ego play when we're talking about editors or journalists or anyone else in any profession, I do think that NPR is being accused of not being transparent and not looking at the mistakes that it makes. And that's going to be important as this story continues, not just in this article, but as we look at what has happened since it was published. Politics also intruded into NPR's COVID coverage. And hi, YouTube. Hi, YouTube watchers. Thank you for watching. I did say the word COVID. Please don't block this video. But if you have to, let me know in advance and I will, I will appeal that block before you do so. Most notably in reporting on the origin of the pandemic. One of the most dismal aspects of COVID journalism is how quickly it defaulted to ideological storylines. I'll, I'll agree there. For example, there was Team Natural Origin, supporting the hypothesis that the virus came from a wild animal market in Wuhan, China. And on the other side, Team Lab Leak. I, I, I would not describe these. I, I don't like describing journalistic uh, movements in twilight terms, uh, but it is effective in terms of understanding what's happening. Leading into the idea that the virus escaped from a Wuhan lab. The lab leak theory came in for rough treatment almost immediately, dismissed as racist or right-wing conspiracy theory. 
Anthony Fauci and former NIH head Francis Collins, representing the public health establishment, were its most notable critics. And that was enough for NPR. We became fervent members of Team Natural Origin, even declaring that the lab leak had been debunked by scientists. But that wasn't the case. When word first broke of a mysterious virus in Wuhan, a number of leading virologists immediately suspected it could have leaked from a lab there conducting experiments on bat coronaviruses. This was in January of 2020, during calmer moments before a global pandemic had been declared and before fears spread and politics intruded. And I've noticed this particular kind of phenomenon in things that are far less important than when the, where the pandemic came from or politics in general. Like when I talk about Star Wars, I noted very quickly that when we talked about The Last Jedi, which is obviously a very divisive internet topic at this point, there was a period of time, like maybe a day or two, when that movie first released, where you could have legitimate conversations and criticisms online about what the plot did, how the characters interacted, things that I enjoy talking about. And then over the course of maybe a week from the release of that movie, it kind of part partitioned off into what would charitably be described as kind of right-wing and not right-wing arguments with respect to The Last Jedi. Uh, and I got boxed into one specific direction. And that doesn't have to be the case, but these things do occur for both serious and not so serious topics. And I think it's legitimate to point out when you at a journalistic outlet are seeing that happen internally. Reporting on a possible lab leak soon became radioactive. Fauci and Collins apparently encur encouraged the March publication of an influential scientific paper known as the Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2. Its authors wrote that they didn't believe any type of laboratory-based scenario is plausible, but the lab leak hypothesis wouldn't die, and understandably so. In private, even some of the scientists who penned the article dismissing it sounded a different tune. One of the authors, Andrew Rembault, an evolutionary biologist from Edinburgh University, wrote to his colleagues, I literally swivel day by day, thinking it is a lab escape or natural. Over the course of the pandemic, a number of investigative journalists made compelling, if not conclusive, cases for the lab leak. But at NPR, we weren't about to swivel or even tiptoe away from the insistence with which we backed the natural origin story. We didn't budge when the Energy Department, the federal agency with the most expertise about laboratories and biological research, concluded, albeit with low confidence, that a lab leak was the most likely explanation for the emergence of the virus. Instead, we introduced our coverage of that development on February 28th, 2023, by asserting confidently the scientific evidence overwhelmingly points to a natural origin for the virus. When a colleague on our science desk was asked why they were so dismissive of the lab leak theory, the response was odd. The colleague compared it to the Bush administration's unfounded argument that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction, apparently meaning that we won't get fooled again. But these two events were not even remotely related. Again, politics were blotting out the curiosity and independence that ought to have been driving our work. And here, I think you've got another kind of ego-based argument, right? He thinks this is wrong. His The suggestion between the lines here is he thinks that the lab leak theory is, is quite plausible. In fact, he might even think that it is true uh, and is objecting to various things that I think make a, a, an amount of sense, right? You might reference the, the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq as essentially saying we don't have to just take government agencies for their word. But obviously, if you're picking and choosing which government agencies you do take for their word, that's an issue. But I don't think it is as ridiculous a response as Mr. Berliner is stating here. And I think you do have that kind of squeezing in around the edges of an article like this one. I'm offering three examples of widely followed stories where I believe we faltered. Our coverage is out there in the public domain. Anyone can read or listen for themselves and make their own judgment. But to truly understand how independent journalism suffered at NPR, you need to step inside the organization. You need to start with former CEO John Lansing. Lansing came to NPR in 2019 from the federally funded agency that oversees Voice of America. Like others who have served in the top job at NPR, and I think this is important to understanding some of the stuff we're going to talk about in a minute, he was hired primarily to raise money and to ensure good working relations with hundreds of member stations that acquire NPR's programming. And if you don't know CEO positions or president of college positions at some of these large institutions that have a role like NPR's or other NGOs or nonprofits, then you might not be familiar with the fact that a CEO at these organizations isn't as directing of executive function as they might be in a Fortune 500 company, right? So what Mr. Berliner here is saying has been my experience with companies like this one, and I cannot pretend to have internal understanding of NPR, but I do have internal understanding of other organizations that are at least similarly structured. They were hired to, to raise money. That, that grant getting, that fund getting, that donors are such an important part of this job that you have the highest, most 
visible person at your institution, essentially as a massive fundraiser, more than steering the ship of the company. So here's, he's hired primarily to make money and to work with the stations that are otherwise the customers of NPR, that they're licensing the NPR product. After working mostly behind the scenes, Lansing became a more visible and forceful figure after the killing of George Floyd in May 2020. It was an anguished time in the newsroom, personally and professionally, so for NP so for, and professionally so for NPR staffers. Sorry, it was, it was a very bad time for NPR staffers. Given the circumstances of Floyd's death, it would have been an ideal moment to tackle a difficult question. Is America, as progressive activists claim, beset by systemic racism in the 2020s in law enforcement, education, housing, and elsewhere, we happen to have a very powerful tool for answering such questions, journalism. Journalism that lets evidence lead the way. But the message from the top was very different. America's infestation with systemic racism was declared loud and clear. It was a given. Our mission was to change it. When it comes to identifying and ending systemic racism, Lansing wrote in a company-wide article, we could be agents of change. Listening and deep reflection are necessary, but not enough. They must be followed by constructive and meaningful steps forward. I will hold myself accountable for this. For this. And so you see agents of change, right? This is an, an activist kind of sentiment and not, not meant in a disparaging way. It is taking action rather than reporting on something. We can be agents of change. We see this language in a bunch of different places, but it is at least potentially concerning when we look at it from a journalistic standpoint of reporting again on truth. And I did, before we get a little bit further in this article, want to catch a few things that I might have missed a little bit earlier. So uh, Vintage Willow, thank you so much for gifting five Hoglaw memberships. I really do appreciate it. And Rob at Law and Lumber, we were just talking about you and you guys covering such wonderful things in the Law Tube landscape here on YouTube. Thank you so much for gifting 10 Hoglaw memberships. I really appreciate it, Rob. Go check out his channel, folks, if you're interested in more legal stuff. He's covering a whole lot of it on his channel. So thank you so much, Rob. And I think we are caught up there. So we'll get back to the article here. Uh, and we were told that NPR itself was part of the problem. In confessional language, he said the leaders of public media, and that's an editorialized statement, right? Starting with me, must be aware of how we ourselves have benefited from white privilege in our careers. We must understand the unconscious bias we bring to our work and interactions. And we must commit ourselves, body and soul, to profound changes in ourselves and our institutions. And again, these statements aren't necessarily anything terribly negative about NPR. He is highlighting that they are being more activist than maybe we should be comfortable with in our journalistic pursuits. But you start to get the notion that these are things that Mr. Berliner probably disagrees with at some fundamental level between the lines, right? Race and identity became paramount in nearly every aspect of the workplace. Journalists were required to ask everyone we interviewed their race, gender, and ethnicity, among other questions, and had to enter it into a centralized tracking system. We were given unconscious bias training sessions. A growing DEI staff offered regular meetings imploring us to start talking about race. Monthly dialogues were offered for women of color and men of color. Non-binary people of color were included too. These initiatives, bolstered by a million dollar grant from the NPR Foundation, came from management from the top down. Crucially, they were in sync culturally with what was happening at the grassroots among producers, reporters, and other staffers. Most visible was a burgeoning number of employee resource or affinity groups based in identity. I don't think anything he's described here is too terribly unique to NPR as opposed to any other organization in the United States. I've certainly seen this at law firms that I have worked at, as well as for clients that I represent. They included MGI POC, Marginalized Genders and Intersex People of Color Mentorship Program, Mia Genti, Latinx employees at NPR, and I apologize for any of these pronunciations I get wrong, NPR Noir, Black employees at NPR, Southwest Asians and North Africans at NPR, UMA for Muslim identifying employees, women, gender expansive and transgender people and technology throughout public media, Kaviri, Jewish heritage and culture at NPR, and NPR Pride, LGBTQIA employees at NPR. All this reflected a broader movement in the culture of people clustering together based on idolatry ideology or characteristic of birth. If, as NPR's internal website suggested, the groups were simply a great way to meet like-minded colleagues and help new, new employees feel included, it would have been one thing. But the role and standing of affinity groups, including those outside NPR, were more than that. They became a priority for NPR's union, SAG-AFTRA, an item in collective bargaining. The current contract in a section on DEI requires NPR management to keep up to date with current language and style guidance from journalism affinity groups and to inform employees if language differs from the diktats of those of those groups. In such a case, 
the dispute could go before the DEI Accountability Committee. In essence, this means the NPR union, of which I am a dues-paying member, has ensured that advocacy groups are given a seat at the table in determining the terms and vocabulary of our news coverage. And as an editor, right, this is where you really get into the weeds here is I think what comes across in this section is that Mr. Berliner doesn't love the fact that these groups are dictating what it is that he can and can't say in the articles that he's editing for NPR. Conflicts between workers and bosses, between labor and management are common in workplaces. NPR has had its share. But what's notable is the extent to which people at every level of NPR have comfortably coalesced around the progressive worldview. And this, I believe, is the most damaging development at NPR, the absence of viewpoint diversity. And that's what he leaves this article on, but he doesn't discuss it further from there. Oh, yes, he does. Sorry. There's an unspoken consensus about the stories we should pursue and how they should be framed. It's frictionless, one story after another about instances of supposed racism, transphobia, signs of the climate apocalypse, Israel doing something bad, and the dire threat of Republican policies. It's almost like an assembly line. The mindset prevails in choices about language. In a document called NPR Transgender Coverage Guidance, disseminated by news management, we're asked to avoid the term biological sex. The mindset animates bizarre stories on how the Beatles and bird names are racially problematic and others that are alarmingly divisive, justifying looting with claims that fear about crime are racist and suggesting that Asian Americans who oppose affirmative action have been manipulated by white conservatives. More recently, we've approached the Israel-Hamas war and its spillover onto streets and campuses through the intersectional lens that has jumped from the faculty lounge to newsrooms, oppressor versus oppressed. That's meant highlighting the suffering of Palestinians at almost every turn while downplaying the atrocities of October 7th. Overlooking how Hamas intentionally puts Palestinian civilians in peril and giving little weight to the explosion of anti-Semitic hate around the world. For nearly all of my career, working at NPR has been a source of great pride. It's a privilege to work in the newsroom at a crown jewel of American journalism. My colleagues are congenial and hardworking, but I can't count the number of times I would meet someone, describe what I do, and they'd say, I love NPR, and they wouldn't stop there. They would mention their favorite host or one of those driveway moments where a story was so good you'd stay in your car until it was finished. It still happens, but often now the trajectory of the conversation is different. And the initial I love NPR, after the initial I love NPR, there's a pause and a person will acknowledge, I don't listen as much as I used to. Or with some chagrin, what's happening there? Why is NPR telling me what to think? In recent years, I've struggled to answer that question. Concerned by the lack of viewpoint diversity, I looked at voter registration for our newsroom. In DC, where NPR is headquartered and many of us live, I found 87 registered Democrats working in editorial positions and zero Republicans. None. So on May 3rd, 2021, I presented the findings at an all-hands editorial staff meeting. When I suggested we had a diversity problem with a score of 87 Democrats and zero Republicans, the response wasn't hostile. It was worse. It was met with profound indifference. I got a few messages from surprised, curious colleagues, but the messages were of the, oh, wow, that's weird variety, as if the lopsided tally was a random anomaly rather than a critical failure of our diversity North Star. In a follow-up exchange email, a top NPR news executive told me that she had been skewered for bringing up diversity of thought when she arrived at NPR. So she said, I want to be careful about how we discuss this publicly. For years, I have been persistent. When I believe our coverage has gone off the rails, I've written regular emails to top news leaders, sometimes even having one-on-one -on -one sessions with them. On March 10th, 2022, I wrote to a top news executive about the numerous times we described the controversial education bill in Florida as the don't say gay bill when it doesn't even use the word gay. I pushed to set the record straight and wrote another time to ask why we kept using the word that many Hispanics hate, Latinx. On March 31st, 2022, I was invited to a manager's meeting to present my observation. Throughout these exchanges, no one ever trashed me. That's not the NPR way. People are polite, but nothing changes. So I've become a visible wrong thinker at a place I love. It's uncomfortable and sometimes heartbreaking. Even so, out of frustration on November 6, 2022, I wrote to the captain of ship North Star, CEO John Lansing about the lack of viewpoint diversity and asked if we could have a conversation about it. I got no response, so I followed up four days later. He said he would appreciate hearing my perspective and copied his assistant to set up a meeting. On December 15th, the morning of the meeting, Lansing's assistant wrote back to cancel our conversation because he was under the weather. She said he was looking forward to chatting and a new meeting invitation would be sent, but it never came. I won't speculate about why our meeting never happened. Being CEO of NPR is a demanding job with lots of constituents and headaches to deal with. But what's indisputable is that no one in a C-suite or upper management position has chosen to deal with the lack of viewpoint diversity at NPR and how that affects our journalism. So here we're seeing Mr. Berliner try to establish that he tried to do this internally and not, quote unquote, air the dirty laundry out in public. That's going to be important as well. 
which is a shame because for all the emphasis on our North Star, NPR's news audience in recent years has become less diverse, not more so. Back in 2011, our audience leaned a bit to the left, but roughly reflected American politically. Now the audience is cramped into a smaller progressive silo. Despite all the resources we devoted to building up our news audience among blacks and Hispanics, the numbers have barely budged. In 2023, according to our demographic research, 6% of our news audience was black, far short of the overall U.S. adult population, which is 14.4%, and Hispanics were only 7% compared to the overall Hispanic adult population, around 19%. Our news audience doesn't come close to reflecting America. It's overwhelmingly white and progressive and clustered around coastal cities and college towns. That is admittedly where I've heard the most NPR. These are perilous times for news organizations. Last year, NPR laid off or bought out 10% of its staff and canceled four podcasts following a slump in advertising revenue. Our radio audience is dwindling and our podcast downloads are down from 2020. The digital stories on our website rarely have national impact. They aren't conversation starters. Our competitive advantage in audio, where for years NPR had no peer, the RA's radio after all, is vanishing. There are plenty of informative and entertaining podcasts to choose from. Hey folks, I hope this is an entertaining and informative podcast. Even without our diminished audience, there's evidence that trouble at the most basic level. Trust. In February, our audience insights team sent an email proudly announcing that we had a higher trustworthy score than CNN or the New York Times. But the research from the Harris poll is hardly reassuring. It found that three in 10 audience members familiar with NPR said they associate NPR with the characteristic of trustworthy. Only in a world where media credibility has completely imploded would a three in 10 trustworthy score be something to boast about. That is admittedly bad, but as we've talked about here, media trust is way, way down. With declining ratings, sorry levels of trust, and an audience that has become less diverse over time, the trajectory for NPR is not promising. Two paths seem clear. We can keep doing what we're doing, hoping it will all work out. Or we could start over with the basic building blocks of journalism. We could face up to where we've gone wrong. News organizations don't go in for that kind of reckoning. But there's a good reason for NPR to be the first. We're the ones with the word public in our name, and funding of public. Despite our missteps at NPR, the funding isn't the answer. As the country becomes more fractured, there's still a need for a public institution where stories are told and viewpoints exchanged in good faith. Reasonable minds can differ. Defunding as a rebuke from Congress wouldn't change the journalism at NPR. That needs to come from within. A few weeks ago, NPR welcomed a new CEO, Catherine Maher, more on her in a second, who's been a leader in tech. She doesn't have a news background, which could be an asset given where things stand. I'll be rooting for her. It's a tough job. Her first role could be simple enough. Don't tell people how to think. It could even be the new North Star. And so that is the article from Mr. Berliner. This is the one that lit the media world on fire uh, for a short period of time. And uh, we'll talk about how that looked in just a second. But there was a New York Times article about NPR being in turmoil. There were a bunch of social media posts about this. At bare minimum, if you're NPR, this is a problem for you, right? Because you have a journalist of 25 years of seniority going out to another website and saying, these are all the very bad things that are happening at my employer. And even outside of journalism, this would be an issue for an employer that had this happen with an employee. So one thing I do want to talk to people about is whether or not Mr. Berliner should be punished for going out to the public with something like this, essentially airing his employer's dirty laundry. How do you feel about that in the comments? Let me know, because we're going to see that he will, in fact, face certain consequences from all of this. And as someone that has essentially accused NPR of not dealing with its mistakes in the past, that is a potential problem for NPR still as well. So let me know. Charlie says, I can say as a person who used to listen to a lot of NPR podcasts, I have stopped listening to quite a few. It was just too depressing for me. I don't necessarily feel like they told me how to think. Fair. And I can't pretend to have listened to a lot of NPR podcasts in my day. So if you don't feel that way, I think that reasonable minds can certainly differ when Mr. Berliner starts editorializing as to what is happening at NPR, uh, that you don't have to agree with him, certainly, when you get to the end of this. Just because, thank you for being a member for so long. I think part of me stepping away from NPR podcasts is that they made their politics podcast daily years ago, and it didn't need to be, that there aren't enough news items uh, politically daily. That's probably fair. Stephanie, who asks Katie Cotton, can you vote then if you're independent with this strange old voter man system? Uh, I don't know what Katie said before, but certainly you don't have to take on a Democrat or Republican mantle in the United States to go and vote in an election. But it does become a problem potentially at primaries, depending on which state you're trying to vote in. 
Sour Cookie says it's a free country and he's not slandering anyone. I don't think anybody is suggesting that he should be thrown in jail. I don't think anybody is saying he has violated the law by doing this. Uh, but the question is, is this something an employer has to put up with, especially a journalistic one that is getting essentially called out in the media outside of its purview? So I, I, I do think that a reasonable mind could look at this and say, all right, maybe he's entirely right. Maybe we do need to change things. And from a logistical, real politic kind of standpoint, I don't want to do anything problematic to him because I think that'll just make it, us look worse. But on a, for, on a purely neutral level, if you're an employer and you have an employee go out there with something like this, how are you feeling about that employee? And do you want to punish them for, for going out with this kind of information? Just because says, also, I don't need so much 24-hour news. I think NPR thrives most when it does light news coverage and does actual education. I think there's a big place for that that doesn't just follow whatever's happening that day and strives to talk about uh, what is happening and why rather than just uh, covering everything 24-7 uh, on a very kind of superficial level. Drama Quiz Biz says he seems smart enough to be prepared for a likely early retirement request. I think that's right. I think this only happens if you if you've been somewhere and you are ready to leave. That that's my that's my kind of interpretation of seeing something like this is that an individual like this is decided that it would be okay if he's asked to leave before he goes out with this. WD Prescott, what would be the difference between this and whistleblowing? Whistleblowing as a concept is really more about talking about illegality, identifying something that is uh, against the law or against a regulation that relates to your employer that would be hidden on the internal side of things and regulators wouldn't know about, rather than essentially saying, uh, my employer is biased in politics, right? That, that's not illegal. Uh, and certainly he has a paragraph there that I think is a good one that says, look, you can read our stuff, you can watch our stuff, you can listen to our stuff and decide for yourself. But I think there's a real problem with the way that we we produce our news. So that's not really whistleblowing as much as it's just kind of talking about things internally. And an employer might have a problem with the internal conversation as well. I, I mentioned those two paragraphs early on where he talks about demographic information. He does it again at the end of the article. And that is information that probably isn't public that you could be accused of violating kind of your obligations to keep proprietary information in-house. Uh, and I think we'll see him accused of that as well. Does the possible harm have to be so great that we then protect the speech of an employee about an employer? Again, it's not harm. It has to be illegal, really, to start talking about that. And from a whistleblower statute kind of thing, that's going to be more federal laws than anything else. So I don't think we need to protect him from doing these things. But it is a good question insofar as we want folks to be open and honest about what they're seeing inside their institutions. The angry Latino lawyer says someone said okay to publishing this. And although sharing your thoughts anywhere invites other people's opinions and criticism, I appreciate that it was candid and any consequences should be small. Okay, thank you, the angry Latino lawyer. The Lucian says he said he was in a union. I wonder how that will play into this. Yes, the NPR editors appear to be all part of the uh, NPR union. Hedgehog in Space says NPR used to teach me, but now it's a cycle of the same problems. I've moved on to more niche and informative content. Hopefully that's me, Hedgehog in Space. Thank you. JJ with the dogs says the Trump presidency destroyed the media on two fronts, public trust in us and creating advocates in journalism. Doesn't matter what side you're on. I tend to agree with this stance overall, JJ with the dog, that for whatever reason, Trump becoming president made activists out of a whole lot of people that were not acting that way beforehand. And as media institutions, that does erode trust. And so I think that paragraph where he says, NPR is one of the highest trusted institutions at three out of 10 is noteworthy, right? Media trust is way down across the board. And for an important reason, when we go into these articles and hangouts and headlines, and then we talk about all these various ways that they frame things, part of that conversation is look at what they're trying to editorialize without saying so. And that is happening more and more. I couldn't even keep up with it if I wanted to do hangouts and headlines on everything important. So our cookie says, I've taken the, if it's important, it'll get to me mentality with news. And it, it turns out if it's important, it gets to me. I think that's fine. I think certainly you can have information overload and be too kind of jacked into the news cycle and get worried about things that probably aren't going to impact you and otherwise get involved in things that probably shouldn't be deleterious to your psychological state of mind. So I think that's a perfectly reasonable position to take. 
Don says he looks so despondent in that picture. Well, what's funny is this is a picture where he does look despondent. I think that's in part just his face. So that's fair. But you can see he's also dramatically lit, right? This is a kind of whistleblower lower picture. Uh, and is he is fair to him. We're going to see another picture in just a moment from NPR reporting on NPR that is less flattering than this one, if you can believe it. Judy, you got this. Is I appreciate that this was published as well. Well, this is a Substack, and this will be described in other places as a Substack, the free press. That is a place where folks go to talk about the place, the, the fact that they think media is too liberal in certain ways. And I use liberal to mean left-facing more than the liberal we discussed earlier in this discussion. Katie says the problem here is policing speech by a government-funded employer. I really don't like that. Yeah, and part of the conversation is the funding that comes from the public, right? You saw at the end of this article that Mr. Berliner said, he says Congress shouldn't take away funding because that's not going to change the way NPR works. That's fine, except that at some level, Congress only has so many levers that they can pull. And if they are publicly funding this and NPR doesn't change, it becomes kind of imperative to say that's not an acceptable way to use taxpayer money from all walks of life in America. Uh, so I do think funding should probably be on the table for Congress. I don't know that it makes up a big item in the budget. I think it doesn't, in fact. So it's not a priority. But I do think it's something that should be discussed. Sour Cookie says he can put he can pivot to writing on a Substack if he wants to continue. In fact, he is right here, right? I think people are paying attention to him now. Yeah, I think he's got a name certainly uh, that will that will carry certain amounts of credit and get certain amount of attention on a Substack. And maybe that was his intent here, right? We can't just discount uh, people's own interests and ego because we might agree with them or disagree with them. Uh, and so this could be a play to say, I'm, I want to leave NPR. I want to have my own name and this is going to get me out there. Uh, but I think he brings up a lot of things that are interesting to talk about with respect to the media. Inquisitive. I think I got that right. I listen to NPR. I don't feel they are telling me how to think. I listen to shows of various political leanings. NPR is not only news. I like radio lab and other non-news shows that they offer. That is totally fair. I like media in general, right? That's one thing people get wrong about hangouts and headlines is that I love the media I think that reporting and journalism is very important to a functioning society, and I would like to see it be done even better. That is the reason why I make this show. So if you don't feel like they're telling you how to think, that's totally fair, and you can disagree with the premises of this article. I don't think that's a problem for anybody. My baffled brain says, look at how new media is gaining traction. People are tired of the same echo chambers in mainstream media. I think there's certainly some truth there, and obviously I'm a beneficiary of that. Um, so that's not the worst thing in the world to me, but I do think even with what we talk about in virtual legality or here in Hangouts and Headlines, we need journalists, we need people on the ground finding out things to report on so that we can talk about them. And so I, I don't have the capacity, I don't have the, the uh, infrastructure to go and report on things myself. So I think we still do need a media that's trustworthy, even with a new media approach, because for the most part, People like me need to piggyback on information that is reported from somewhere. SSSR? NPR is guilty of the same issues that plague CNN. The concept of having both sides for the sake of having both sides, even when one side argues the sky is blue and the other is adamant that it's green. Now, see, that to me sounds like you're suggesting that they're too, uh, they're, they're too open to new ideas, which is essentially the opposite of what this article is suggesting, which maybe is the case. I cannot claim any expertise on NPR, but it certainly sounds like the opposite of what Mr. Berliner is saying is happening there. Don Hoglaw says, Hoglaw isn't niche. It's very broad and diverse in topics. Well, I have a lot of broad interests, but I think we're still pretty niche to go and listen to a lawyer talk about media articles on a weekday morning. So I'm not gonna claim that I'm CNN or NPR, Although if we want more subscribers and more people to listen and uh, upvotes and comments are all helpful to YouTube. So thank you for that. Hedgehog in space. Hogue, of course you're my favorite informative content. I'm here after all. Thanks, Hedgehog in space. Judy says, Hogue, I hope your finger heals quickly. Always love it when I injure my middle finger. I think I'm just holding a pen, right? Is that? Okay. Or it's a joke. See, it's a sly smile. 
I, uh, I I don't know. I think it might be a joke from you. You got this. Uh, I don't have any pr- ch- chance of saying that name correctly. NPR used to have so many different educational programs, not so much anymore, and it's disappointing. Ms. VG3 says this seems more about internal conditions, but the tone and tenor of NPR reporting that he describes predates current days. It was a running joke on Saturday Night Live for years. Yeah, and there's a lot of jokes about NPR uh, radio in a lot of places, right? There's a um, there's a public radio joke that I really like in Parks and Recreation, where she sh- where she shows up and is asked to read like the intro for like Ugandan throat singers with. Uh, jungle noises or something along those lines and they and they the uh the dj is very much like oh yes this is a wonderful indigenous culture sound and it's it's like just random noises that you hear on the radio and i think it's a very good sequence so npr has always been able to be accused of that kind of thing but i think it is interesting to have that kind of thing have a certain amount of public presence and this is a little bit different in terms of politics and whether or not they do tell you how to think and don't have that diverse perspective of of being representative of all of America in terms of politics and thinking about things. All right. So I told you there was more to this story. Let me catch Annabelle here as a member for 17 months. I listened every morning, but it's no longer various stories, but heavy emphasis stories. I can't get I can get info many places now. Yeah, it's not a, an overview of things. It's it's deep dives. It's fair, Annabelle. Thank you. And SSS Har says it is the opposite to me. I stopped listening because I was seeing that both sides reporting without providing context. Totally fair. And that's the exact opposite reason why you didn't why you're not listening to NPR anymore. And that could be a part of the story that Mr. Berliner doesn't capture in his article. All right. So let's look. Oh, Judy says it looked like uh it looked like on my small screen that you had a splint on it. Oh, I might have been. I might have been like capturing my uh, my pen with my little clip her thing. I do that a lot. Um, uh, so no problems. Smiley face, laughing emoji times two. All right. Katie says, Hogue, I wish we could have H&H once a week. That's really the ideal. That's what I would like it to be at, Katie. Um, but it's a matter of getting all my ducks in a row, to be honest with you, and, and making sure that I can do everything I need to do in my life and for my family and everything else. So I would like to be here once a week on h and I'd also like to do a virtual legality once a week. We do BitCast once a week on Sundays. Uh, so we all have goals. I will continue striving towards mine, I promise. All right. So with that said, let's go back to our little article discussion. So after this article comes out, I told you there's a New York Times article that talks about uh, the problems at NPR, there's other various media outlets that capture this and say NPR is in trouble. And here is Ben Mullen, I think the media reporter at the New York Times, who says about 50 NPR employees sign a letter to CEO Catherine Maher and top editor Edith Chapin calling for, among other things, a public rebuke of the factual inaccuracies and elisions in Yuri Berliner's free press essay. And we can see here, dear Catherine and Edith, In the wake of Yuri Berliner's essay in the Free Press, we're writing to urge stronger support for staff who have had their journalistic expertise called into question by one of their own in a public forum. We also urge more transparency regarding the consequences of making unauthorized public comments that seek to change NPR's editorial direction. While your internal notes to staff last week and developments this week were informative, back to that in in a minute, there are still unanswered questions about how NPR staff are expected to conduct themselves. We understand the difficult and unique position you found yourselves in. It is a thorny occurrence that isn't easily resolved. This incident leaves us with many pressing questions. Among them, what and who are our standards for? Are we all being held to the same scrutiny? And will we all be going forward? More specifically, we need clarification from leadership on how this affects NPR's editorial direction. Staff, many from marginalized backgrounds, have pushed for internal policy changes through mechanisms like the DEI Accountability Committee, sharing of affinity group guidelines, and an ad hoc content review group. Our impression is that an unauthorized public comment like this has attracted more attention and immediate reaction from leadership than those longstanding efforts. It appears to have ushered in a monthly content review board that has been under discussion. What is your guidance for staff who do care about NPR and make well-intended efforts to change editorial choices for better going forward? So this statement is 
hey, look, we've been trying to go about things the right way. If you're only going to make changes for th people doing things the wrong way, aren't you encouraging us to all go do things the wrong way? And how will leadership take into account the impact, the fact that Berliner's public comments have made the jobs of our colleagues harder and have attracted harassment for them? For every person who might tear down their colleagues in public, there are scores of people steadily trying to make change from within. Sending the message that a public essay is the easiest way to make change is setting a bad precedent regardless of the ideologies being expressed. We'd like to offer a few suggestions for a course of action. One, clarify what precedent has been set going forward for all colleagues. Provide detailed consequences for those who repeatedly violate NPR's code of conduct, who make those decisions, and on what timeline. Two, offer public support and defense of those individuals whose work was directly undermined by the opinion piece. And I think actually if we go back and we look at Mr. Berliner's piece, for the most part, with the exception of Mr. Lansing, who's called out by name, I don't think that he actually goes and tears down anybody. Uh, he calls people fair-minded. He doesn't use names for the most part. Number three, publicly and directly call out the piece's factual inaccuracies and elisions. Others, including NPR staff, have already done so, but hearing it come from NPR management would hold even greater weight. Clearer communication around and response to these concerns would go a long way towards helping restore some sense of the collective morale that has eroded within the last week. Without true leadership, resentment and discontent are festering among your staff, and the silence only serves to legitimize his essay, even if that is not your intent. We work at NPR because we believe in public media and its ability to educate, inform, and affect its audiences. We strive to do this by being truly open to a diversity of viewpoints and wish to continue doing so without having our journalistic integrity called into question by one of our own colleagues. Signed, and then they've got a signature page that is not included in this particular tweet. And so you see NPR is in a certain amount of turmoil when this all happens, and then NPR reports on itself. So as of a couple of days ago, NPR suspends veteran editor as it grapples with his public criticism, as reported on by NPR. And as I said, here we don't get the dramatic lighting. We just get Yuri Berliner looking a little bit sadder, uh, and he is suspended by NPR. NPR has formally punished Yuri Berliner, the senior editor who publicly argued a week ago that the network had lost America's trust by approaching news stories with a rigidly progressive mindset. Berliner's five-day suspension without pay, which began last Friday, has not been previously reported. So his article gets written on a Tuesday or published on a Tuesday. He's suspended on that Friday, and then this is reported as of like Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. Yet, the public radio network is grappling in other ways with the fallout from Berliner's essay for the online news site, The Free Press. It angered many of his colleagues, led NPR leaders to announce monthly internal reviews of the network's coverage, and gave fresh ammunition to conservative and partisan Republican critics of NPR, including former President Donald Trump. And in the context of Mr. Berliner's essay in the free press, this paragraph is a little bit interesting because here's an NPR reporter saying everybody's upset, it led to changes within NPR, and perhaps most damaging of all, it helped give ammunition to folks like President Donald Trump, right? Which sounds, in its initial instance, as we read this article, like you are giving evidence that Mr. Berliner is correct as to how NPR thinks of things. So that's not a great look. None of this is a great look for NPR because you've got legitimate criticism that could be answered by a journalistic outlet and says, that's not the way we do things. We don't go outside and the family, as it were, with our complaints about how things are run inside. Uh, and could have a more public stance, but you've got a CEO that isn't making statements. And in fact, as we will see in this article, doesn't give quotes for this reporting by NPR itself. Conservative activist Christopher Rufo is among those now targeting NPR's new chief executive, Catherine Maher, for messages she posted to social media years before joining the network. Among others, those posts include a 2020 tweet that called Trump racist and other that appeared to minimize rising, rioting during social justice protests that year. Maher took the job at NPR last month, her first at a news organization. In a statement Monday about the messages she had posted, Maher praised the integrity of NPR's journalists and underscored the independence of their reporting. So in terms of what's been happening on like Twitter, Christopher Rufo is a name that has come up before. He's a bit of an activist himself. On the other side of the spectrum, to what Mr. Berliner is accusing NPR of doing, and he found a number of tweets from Ms. Maher uh, when she was running, I think, Wikipedia about various progressive things, including Mr. Trump being racist and uh, some other things like um, 
dreaming about Kamala Harris, I believe. And you don't have to love Christopher Rufo. He's an activist, just like Mr. Berliner is accusing NPR of being. But he did find these things and they were out and, and people had been discussing Ms. Berliner and her positions on various things since. So that is out there. And Ms. Maher says, in America, everyone is entitled to free speech as a private citizen. And again, I don't think anybody is intending to jail Ms. Maher or anyone else related to this story for these things. No one is accusing her of violating the law when she says something that's pro-Biden or what have you. But it is an open question when you're accused of your organization becoming more political than it should be as to whether or not your politics are going to impact the way the organization is run. What matters is NPR's work and my commitment as its CEO, public service, editorial independence, and the mission to serve all of the American public. NPR is independent, beholden to no party, and without commercial interests. The network noted that the CEO is not involved in editorial decisions. In an interview with me later on Monday, Berliner said the social media posts demonstrated Maher was all but incapable of being the person best poised to direct the organization. We're looking for a leader right now who's going to be unifying and bring more people into the tent and have a broader perspective on sort of what America is all about, Berliner said. And this seems to be the opposite of that. And here's Ms. Maher. He said that he tried repeatedly to make his concerns over NPR's coverage known to news leaders and to Maher's predecessor as chief executive before publishing his essay. Berliner has singled out coverage of several issues dominating the 2020s for criticism, including trans rights, the, the Israel-Hamas war, and COVID. Berliner says he sees the same problems at other news organizations, but argues NPR, as a mission-driven institution, has a greater obligation to fairness. Honestly, I think all journalists have, a, had a, have an obligation to fairness, but here we are. I love NPR and feel it's a national trust, Berliner says. We have great journalists here. If they shed their opinions and did the great journalism they're capable of, this would be a much more interesting and fulfilling organization for our listeners. A final warning. The circumstances surrounding the interview were singular. Berliner provided me with a copy of the formal rebuke to review. NPR did not confirm or comment upon his suspension for this article, which again, I said, is interesting, right? NPR is not otherwise commenting on this to their own reporter. In presenting Berliner's suspension Thursday afternoon, the organization told the editor he had failed to secure its approval for outside work for other news outlets, as is required of NPR journalists. It's called the letter a final warning, says Berliner, and it would be fired if he violated NPR's policy again. Berliner is a dues-paying member of NPR's newsroom union, but says he is not appealing the punishment. The free press is a site that has become a haven for journalists who believe that mainstream media outlets have become too liberal. And again, this is a descriptor of the free press from NPR. Obviously, that article in the free press is critical of NPR, so this editorializing isn't unexpected, but it is in existence. In addition to his essay, Berliner appeared in an episode of its podcast, Honestly, with Barry Weiss. A few hours after the essay appeared online, NPR chief business editor Pallavi Gogi reminded Berliner of the requirement that he secure approval before appearing in outside press, according to a copy of the note provided by Berliner. In its formal rebuke, NPR did not cite Berliner's appearance on Chris Cuomo's News Nation program last Tuesday night, for which NPR gave him the green light. NPR's chief communications officer told Berliner to focus on his own experience and not share proprietary information. The NPR letter also did not cite his remarks to the New York Times, which ran its article mid-afternoon Thursday, shortly before the reprimand was sent. Berliner says he did not seek approval before talking with the Times, which is suggestive of the fact that NPR is picking and choosing when to actually use its rules and just doesn't like the Free Press article, which is not unexpected. He was very critical of NPR. Berliner says he did not get permission from NPR to speak with me for this story, but he said he was not worried about the consequences. Talking to an NPR journalist and being fired for that would be extraordinary, I think. Berliner is a member of NPR's business desk, as am I, and he has helped to edit many of my stories. He had no involvement in the preparation of this article and did not see it before it was posted publicly. In rebuking Berliner, NPR said he had also publicly released proprietary information about audience demographics, which it considers confidential. He said those figures were essentially marketing material. If they had been really good, they probably would have been distributed. The, they probably would have distributed them and sent them out to the world. He's not wrong there, but that also doesn't give him the right to release confidential information. And I say this with the tilt of a corporate lawyer, right? So you go and you get these polls created for what you're receiving uh, from your audience members. You're using this for audience demographics in advertising sales and things of that nature. And then he goes out with them publicly. That is proprietary. That is of some value to you and you alone. It is also value to your competitors. And 
So even though he says that if they were really good, he'd probably share them with the world, which is undoubtedly true, it doesn't give him the right to just unilaterally decide to release some of those. I don't think they were the, the most important things in the world. They didn't cross tab and go into very deep analytical information, but I, I do side with NPR on saying that was maybe a little bit of a breach of trust. Feelings of anger and betrayal inside the newsroom. His essay and subsequent public remarks stirred deep anger and dismay within NPR. Colleagues contend Berliner cherry-picked examples to fit his arguments and challenge the accuracy of his accounts. They also note that he did not seek comment from the journalists involved in the work he cited. Morning Edition host Michael Martin told me some colleagues at the network share Berliner's concerns that coverage is frequently presented through an ideological or idealistic prism that can alienate listeners. The way to address that is through training and mentorship, says Martin, herself a veteran of nearly two decades of the network, who has also reported for the Wall Street Journal and ABC News. And we don't we don't air our dirty laundry, right? We do that internally. The way to address that is internally. It's not by blowing this place up, by trashing your colleagues in full view of people who don't really care about it anyway. Several NPR journalists told me they are no longer willing to work with Berliner as they no longer have confidence that he will keep private their internal musings about stories as they work through coverage. Newsrooms run on trust, NPR political correspondent Danielle Kurtzleben tweeted last week without mentioning Berliner by name. If you violate everyone's trust by going to another outlet, and uh, I believe that is probably shitting, on your colleagues while doing a bad job journalistically for that matter, I don't know how you do your job now. Now this takes a particularly myopic perspective to have this line saying, if you violate everyone's trust by crapping on your colleagues, and then have the parenthetical be while doing a bad job journalistically for that matter. That, that, is, that is someone that is not fully self-aware. I don't know how you do your job now. Berliner rejected that critique, saying nothing in his essay or subsequent remarks betrayed private observations or arguments about coverage. And I agree, I agree, I don't see any of that in the article that we read. Other newsrooms are also grappling with questions over news judgment and confidentiality. On Monday, New York Times executive editor Joseph Kahn announced to his staff that the newspaper's inquiry into who leaked internal dissent over a planned episode of its podcast, The Daily, to another news outlet proved inconclusive. The episode was to focus on a December report on the use of sexual assault as part of the Hamas attack on Israel in October. Audio staffers aired doubts over how well the reporting stood up to scrutiny. At NPR, some of Berliner's colleagues have weighed in online against his claim that the, the network has focused on diversifying its workforce without a concomitant commitment. Concomitant commitment is a heck of a phrase there, NPR, to diversity of viewpoint. Recently retired chief executive John Lansing has referred to this pursuit of diversity within NPR's workforce as its North Star, a moral imperative and chief business strategy. NPR investigative reporter Chiara Eisner wrote in a comment for this story, minorities do not all think the same and do not report the same. Good reporters and editors should know that by now. It's embarrassing to me as a reporter at NPR that a senior editor here missed that point in 2024, apparently implying that Mr. Berliner's complaints about NPR can all be put at the feet of complaints about DEI, but he actually says at the end of his articles, we just read, that there's a problem with Democratic registration and Republican registration, a actual difference in viewpoints within the newsroom, rather than what is represented by the, the color of people's skin or their cultural background. So this is, a, this is a really weird quote from Ms. Eisner, because that is not the accusation. And in fact, it kind of reads the opposite, it suggests that getting the percentages right is representative of diversity of thought while then also saying they don't all think the same way, which we know to be a fact, right? People think differently of all cultures and persuasions. So it's it's a really odd thing. On Friday, CEO Maher stood up for the network's mission and the journalism, taking issue with Berliner's critique, though never mentioning him by name. Among her chief issues, she said, Berliner's essay offered a criticism of our people on the basis of who we are, which doesn't sound right either. Berliner took great exception to that, saying she had denigrated him. He said that he supported diversifying NPR's workforce to look more like the U.S. population at large. She did not address that in a subsequent private exchange that he shared with me for this story, and an NPR spokesperson declined further comment. Among the questions we'll ask ourselves each month, did we capture the diversity of this country, racial, ethnic, religious, economic, political, geographic, etc., in all its complexity and in a way that helped listeners and readers recognize themselves and their communities? Chapin wrote in a memo. Did we offer coverage that helped them understand, even just a bit better, those neighbors with whom they share little in common? And kind of mirroring that weirdness of the quote that I mentioned above, we again see, okay, we're going to have a monthly meeting to check our, our coverage as to whether or not we've captured the diversity of this country in racial, racial, ethnic, religious, economic, political, and geographic grounds, political being the only one of a kind of ideology there. 
Did we offer coverage that helped them understand even just a bit better? Those neighbors with whom they share little in common seems to be assuming that if you have a different race or different ethnicity, then you don't have much in common with your neighbor. And again, I think that goes back to this kind of quote about whether or not minorities think all the same, right? And there seems to be a difference in philosophy between Mr. Berliner and these quotes that are coming out from NPR as to what exactly the diversity initiative is designed to achieve in a modern newsroom. In text for the story, Chapin said such sessions had been discussed since Lansing unified the news and programming divisions under her acting leadership last year. Now seemed the time to deliver if we were going to do it, Chapin said. Healthy discussion is something we need more of. Now, of course, we saw in the report or the or the letter from the people in the NPR newsroom that maybe now was not the right time to do it if it looks like you are rewarding the acts of Mr. Berliner and that you could actually negatively affect morale if it looks like going outside the bounds of the newsroom is the right way to affect change. This story was reported and written by NPR media correspondent David Folkenflick and edited by Deputy Business Editor Emmy Kopp, Emily Kopp and Managing Editor Jerry Holmes. Under NPR's protocol for reporting on itself, no NPR corporate official or news executive reviewed this story before it was posted publicly. Fair enough, and still an interesting way to look at media is when they report on themselves. Uh, but Ms. Mayer, as I said, has been uh, the target, which is maybe a, a, a divisive word, but at least the subject of many tweets and reports at the New York Times. I think I saw a Washington Post article uh, about stuff that has been lifted from uh, what she had posted on her Twitter uh, and has been the subject of a lot of these conversations. And the quotes that we just read, apparently, did cause Mr. Berliner to tender his resignation. I am resigning from NPR, a great American institution where I have worked for 25 years. I don't support calls to defund NPR. I, re I respect the integrity of my colleagues and wish for NPR to thrive and do important journalism. But I cannot work in a newsroom where I am disparaged by a new CEO whose divisive views confirm the very problems at NPR I cite in my free press essay. So again, disparaged seems to be from that quote that we saw referenced about he's uh, he's angry at us for who we are. Uh, and there's a, there's a DEI fight happening here behind the scenes underneath all of this, but I don't know exactly what the nature of that is between Mr. Berliner and NPR. And certainly we're not going to find out anymore now that he has resigned from the NPR newsroom. Uh, so it's an interesting story, but it is one where I think we're not going to get a satisfying answer. Uh, and we're just going to have to see how NPR moves forward with its new CEO, Ms. M Ms. Maher, and uh, how folks actually track with whether or not they listen to NPR, whether they read NPR stuff, and how their audience goes into the future. So what do you all think about that? Is this a fair solution to everything? Should Mr. Berliner have resigned? Should he have taken his uh, suspension and just move forward and try to shape the newsroom as he saw fit? Or is this a situation where the CEO is being uh, attacked at their, one of their editors is going outside the family to talk about the issues internally and something needs to be done to protect the institution's name. So let me know. Uh, and uh, if you have any other comments or hangout stuff that you want to discuss before we leave for today, let me know that as well, because we've got uh, a lot of fun stuff that we've already discussed and a lot of fun stuff to talk about in the future. And I'd love to know what it is that's going on in your lives and what it is that is happening with respect to this story or otherwise. So. Ghostery says he had no choice but to resign. Uh, I think at some point you have to just move on. And certainly NPR saying, okay, you've written this about us and we're going to suspend you and say bad things about you is potentially a problem. Uh, Snow Glare says it sounds like NPR is foobar. Probably best that he moves on. As I said when we were talking about his original article, I do think that if you're going to write that, you're going to put that out there. At least in the back of your mind, you say this could go in a direction where I wind up leaving this job I've had for 25 years. And so I don't know that it was a surprise to him, but you probably don't want to have to hit that button if you can avoid it. Head Jogging Space, thanks for sharing. I thought this was a fun story. I, I hate to see these kinds of things erupt in this way, but I am interested in the way people report on things and what's happening inside these institutions. The Lucian says, if what he said in his article is true, then honestly, I don't know how he thought he would have been welcomed on NPR following it. That's just my thought process. Yeah, you could look at it as potentially the nuclear option, and he was already one foot out the door when he wrote that. Aurora W. says, this definitely sounds like internal personal disagreements that have been aired publicly in part. I do think part of his article winds up sounding like they didn't do what I wanted, they didn't go the direction I wanted, rather than kind of, uh, this is politically a bad move, or this is something that is against journalistic ethics. There are 
certain instances where he talks about things. And I mentioned them when we went through the article where I do think it sounds a little bit like they didn't listen to me. They went in a different direction than I would have. And so I'm unhappy with the way the newsroom is going. Vintage Willow, thank you for being a member for so long. It's nice to be able to hang out live with you all. Happy smiley face emoji. It's nice to be able to hang out with you all as well. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Violet Ivy 2 says, if he felt there was no influence to be had, I understand why he resigned. This article seemed like a last shot at changing things. Yeah, it's possible. I think you, you put that out there with the hope that maybe in some universe, everything changes, everything can be back the way you want NPR to be, but you're not in that CEO role. You're not in that C-level suite. Uh, and so you're doing what you can. And maybe you know that, that the consequences of that might be that you're, you're not going to be in that job any longer. Katie Cotton says, this was a great story. I'm glad Berliner felt compelled to share it. I think he's right. Ray XYZ says, like I said before, journalists are supposed to publish things companies and powerful people don't want said. And that guy has my respect. Don Lionheart says, it's really just a shame how bad our media has gotten. I think there are instances of really good media and good reporting. Like I said, I've actually found a lot of good stuff on that Substack website with different authors. Obviously, your mileage may vary as to who you wind up reading. Uh, but it might be that the future of media is a little bit more niche and a little bit more personal and individualized like we've seen on YouTube. It might be in the same vein in the written space on a place like Substack or whatever the successor to that might be. Sour Cookie says, I choose to think he genuinely cared about his work and that this was a Hail Mary. I think it's a very positive take on it, and I think that certainly could be the case. Todd, it's not like Felicia Somnes who got fired from the Washington Post because she simply wouldn't let something go long after it should have been. Uh, I'm not familiar with that story, I don't think. I, I, I know bits and pieces of it. I remember I remember looking at that uh, a while back. Uh, but yes, I don't think it I don't think it is an analog here. Hedgehog in space says time will tell if he's a whistleblower or merely a loud quitter. I don't know that that's in fact the case here, right? Because there's nothing to actually escalate this. NPR will continue reporting as it chooses to with its new CEO, with whoever is running its newsroom uh, in the future and the various editors that operate in it. Uh, and people will either uh, say that it's gotten bad in terms of politicization and unidirectional thought, or it won't. But that'll be reasonable minds can differ kind of as a topic. Don Leinart, Hogue, I agree. Substack is great. Nate Silver's Substack is excellent. I don't think I've seen Nate's uh, yet, but I have been looking at um, uh, a few in the background, mostly tech. Uh, but I think that if you are interested in certain things, it's a it's a nice site to see really good independent writing coming out of. Rain Man YYC, hey from Calgary all. Happy smiley face emoji. Happy smiley face emoji. Thank you, Rain Man. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you are doing better. Drama Queen Biz says, I wonder if he was influenced by public NPR criticisms like the show In the Know done by Mike Judge recently. I don't know. There's certainly always things that can be happening out in the world that can influence when these things happen. And I think certainly if you've dedicated 25 years of your life to an institution, you have a certain amount of investment, both on a kind of psychological and emotional level. So I, I have no doubt that whatever he's feeling in respect of the company, if it moved away from him, that he's not happy about it. Ghostry, uh, Ms. VG3, I quit pro-journalism in the early 2000s after my news director tried to create local drama by sensationalizing a school incident. Wow. I, I, I am so interested in how many different kind of perspectives and experiences people in this community and in this chat have, and I'm so glad that folks are able to share those experiences with each other here. Joe Munger says, a lot in common with recent stories you've been covering. Well, I try not to just cover politic political stories or things that are of uh, supreme divisiveness uh, on these topics, but I do think that this particular story is one that will be emblematic of some things that we've seen on the Washington Post, we've seen at the New York Times, we've seen at other media outlets. So I do try to I do try to talk about things that I think are important in the space, even if I don't hit all of the high level political culture war stuff. The Lucian, if NPR was smart, they would be watching the public response and gauging how to proceed themselves. Well, and they, they suspended him within that same week that the article went up. So whether or not they are smart, I would say reasonable minds can differ, but they certainly did act in a way that says, if we're being criticized for taking uh, strong political action and not being transparent or thinking about what our actions suggest to the world around us, this was maybe not the right way to go. 
What percentage of the staff is 50 to sign the response? I don't know. You know, you saw that Mr. Berliner got, I think he said newsroom editors to tell him where they were registered politically and it was 87. So it's, it's a big newsroom, uh, but I don't know what 50 represents. Judy, you got this. Depp v. Heard did it for me. Talking to my mother, she had a completely different view of the trial from the mainstream media. And obviously, Hangouts and Headlines exist because of Depp v. Heard. That was the case when I was watching the trial and I was seeing the headlines come out in real time. And I was talking about them on Alita's channel at Legal Bites. And then I brought them over to start headlines over here. That's really where it came from, was being able to watch something in real time and see it spun in just wild directions uh, is why I wanted to talk about this in the first instance with you all. Peter is my first name. In the spirit of sharing, twice, lol, my NPR driveway moment was getting the tire iron out of the truck and removing the car radio with it. Lol, my original NPR joke. I have actually sat in the car and waited till the end of segments before. I don't know if I have for NPR or not. Uh, Todd, I think this is just continuing the move from traditional newsrooms towards independent journalists like Matt Tybee and Glenn Greenwald. I think so too. I think that's part of this whole story is that we are becoming a more individualized kind of bifurcated society on these fronts, but it is going to be problematic moving forward if nobody has a shared understanding of any level of truth in the world. So I do think that there are places for institutions that are, are sharing some notion of actual reporting of what is out there in the world. And to the extent we lose that ability because of partisanism, whichever direction it might lead, I think it's a problem for all of us. Magnus Prime, the early H&Hs were good times. The, the Johnny Depp versus a Amber Heard focused ones, well, we had a lot of specific direction there. Uh, the Lucian, poor Alita, there's a ton of interesting criminal cases going on lately, and she's trying to stream some of them. Great content. Absolutely, check out Legal Bites. Alita's doing great work. A lot of folks are doing great work. We talked about Rob, talked about Emily, talked about Ian. Um, poor Alita, indeed. I don't know how my friends cover so much, how they do all this so often. Um, but if you are interested in covering these cases and, or, or looking at these cases, please do go check those folks out because they are fantastic. Don, speaking of your LawTube colleagues, any lawyers and dragons coming soon? Nothing currently on the calendar. Um, so apologies for that. Don't know when it might come back, if at all. Um, but certainly we love doing lawyers and dragons. And uh, the more we get asked about it, the more likely it is. So thank you so much, Don. Appreciate it. All right, folk. Uh, uh, Don says, Kurt has been covering the Daybell murder trial. I believe it. Some of the stuff that they cover is so kind of outside of what I want to be dealing with on a daily basis that I'm always impressed by them, always uh, impressed by all of my friends on YouTube that are doing all of this stuff. Do check them out. Uh, Judy says, EDB is having pick and choose carefully. Next on her docket, Karen Reed. Yep, I think a lot of them are going to be talking about Karen Reed. Katie says Alita is going to be very busy in five months. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. And do check out all those folks. Thank you for being uh, a supporter of the channel. Likes, upvotes, comments, all that good stuff helps YouTube find this stuff, helps more folks have these conversations with us. Uh, and if you want to subscribe or become a member, support the channel through the various places that are listed in the description, please do that as well. Thank you so much to everybody who has been here. And I will catch you on the next episode of Hangouts and Headlines. All right. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.